I want to welcome you to our Sunday service for May 3rd. And today I'd like you to go with me over to the book of James. And I'd like to begin reading uh, James chapter 5. And we're going to look at uh, verse 7 going all the way down to uh, verse 20. But before we actually get into the text, I want to just remind you, and let's go, uh, as a matter of fact, let's look at James 1, uh, James chapter 1 and, and verse 1 and 2. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ to the 12 tribes which are scattered abroad, greeting my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers temptation. And so James is writing to a scattered church. He's writing to a persecuted church. He's writing to Christ followers whose lives have been turned upside down. Now, the extent of which that was happening in James' day can certainly not be compared to what we're going through today because what we're going through today is is very very light compared to what was happening to the church in the days of James but we do know what it feels like to be scattered we do know what it feels like to have our lives turned upside down and have our schedules upset our jobs in jeopardy our our health in jeopardy, uh, our family in jeopardy. And so James writes this letter as a reminder to a church that is persecuted, a church that is scattered, and a church who, who has had their lives turned upside down. And so with that in mind, would you go with me over to chapter 5, and notice here uh, in verses 7 through 11, James talks about waiting for the Lord. Notice with me, if you will, James chapter 5 and uh, verse 7. Therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You must also be patient. Strengthen your heart, because the Lord's coming is near. Brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another, so that you will not be judged. Look, the judge stands at the door. Brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. See, we, we count it as blessed those who have endured. For you have heard of Job's endurance. You have seen the outcome that the Lord brought about. The Lord is compassionate and merciful. And so as, as James pours out his heart to a church, that is scattered and persecuted and oppressed. James gives this counsel according to verse 7 and 8. He reminds them and reminds us, by the way, to be patient. As a matter of fact, he says, be patient in verse 7, and he also says it in verse 8. So uh, James was really wanting to get that point across, and we really need to hear that in these days because we're becoming restless, aren't we? Our culture is becoming restless and maybe even a little bit rebellious, and of course, uh, in, in the church and in our walk with the Lord, we certainly don't want to display any rebellion, but we, we certainly know what it feels like to be restless. And so James is reminding us, God, God is working in the background. And, and, and all of this is part of his plan. It's part of his design. And sometimes we have to let his plan unfold, don't we? 
And that's never an easy thing to do because we're just, we're not really sure what is what is around the next corner or, or what the next day holds for us. And so Paul, or I'm sorry, James is reminding uh, the church there in the book of James, and he's reminding us, be patient, be patient. And he talks about uh, in verse seven, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. When the farmer puts his crop out, he can't hurry it along as much as he wants it to progress and grow and produce fruit. A lot of things have to happen that are completely out of the farmer's control. He's done what he knew to do, and now he has to late wait for the early and the late rain. And then he comes in again in verse 8. He says, be patient. Strengthen your heart, because the Lord's coming is, is near. And, and it was true in the, days of, in the days of James that the Lord's coming was near, and it's certainly true in our day. And this is part of the unfolding plan of God. And so James reminds us, be patient. And then how about uh, verse 9 here of James chapter 5? Brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another. And when we're sequestered and when we're quarantined and we're having to practice physical distancing and we're having to stay in and stay sheltered, to prevent the spread of the coronavirus, we're in close quarters, aren't we? And what does James say about that? Brothers and sisters, do not complain about one another. And it's, it's interesting about complaining that complaining doesn't help anything, does it? It just makes matters worse. And by the way, no one enjoys being around someone who complains. And so there's an admonition for us. Let's not complain because no one enjoys being around a complainer. And by the way, it doesn't do any good. If anything, it only makes things worse. But if you notice what James says about this, do not complain about one another. So he, he says we're not to complain about one another. We're not to complain to one another. And he reminds us why, so that you will not be judged. And remember, Jesus said that we're accountable for every idle word. Every idle word. Jesus says we're we're accountable for that. And then, and, then, and then so James is reminding us, do not complain about one another so you will not be judged. And, and, and he's reminding of us of our accountability. And oh, by the way, he reminds us that the judge is listening. Look at the end of verse 9. Look, the judge stands at the door. And of course, we know we'll be judged when Jesus comes. We'll all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. But there's another aspect that, of that idea of judgment and accountability. And that is the Lord is looking in on us right now. So therefore, don't complain about one another. It reminds us the judge is is standing at the door. And then he also, he, he reminds us of the examples that we have in the Bible. Uh, notice verse 10, the example of the prophets, uh, brothers and sisters, take the prophets who spoke in the Lord's name as an example of suffering and patience. See, we count as blessed those who have endured. You've heard of, of Job's endurance. You've seen the outcome that the Lord brought about the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And so James is reminding us, consider God's prophets. They were patient. 
in their suffering. And he, he, he adds to that in verse 11, we count as blessed those that have endured. There's, there's just something about patience and uh, endurance, how that the blessing comes in those things that are most un pleasant in our life and none of us like to endure things that are unpleasant but James is reminding us that's where the blessings are when we submit ourselves and subject ourselves to circumstances that are uneasy and unpleasant and uncomfortable James reminds us that's where the blessing is he also mentions Job in verse 11. Consider the endurance of Job. You've heard of Job's endurance and have seen the outcome that the Lord brought about so that the, the latter part of uh, Job's life was better than the early part of his life. And it's interesting. I love what James says here. Because you would think after everything that Job went through, that Job may have had a tendency to be angry at God and bitter about life and uh, sort of hostile in his spirit. But Job was not that way. Notice what James says about it. You've heard of Job's endurance again uh, here in verse 11. You've seen the outcome that the Lord brought about. That is, the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And I want to remind you today that our Lord is compassionate and he's merciful. And when we go through these trials, when we endure scattering and suffering and, uh, and, and, and sickness and, and things of that nature, James reminds us the end result, if we will be patient, the end result is that what people are going to see in our life is not bitterness and rage and hostility and anger. But when people look at our life, they're going to see the Lord is compassionate and merciful. And by the way, don't you want that to be your testimony that the Lord is compassionate and merciful. I mean, that's, that's, that's how we live. That's how we endure. That's, that's why we're able to be patient because of the compassion and the mercy of the Lord. So he talks about waiting for the Lord and being patient. But then he also talks about the outcome. When you... When you're allowing uh, God to work in your life and you're enduring the trials and you're going through the, the uh, scattering and the suffering, what will be the end result or, or what will be one of the byproducts, one of, of just many byproducts or outcomes of what we're going through? We, we see that in verse 12. Notice what he says. Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear at, uh, either by heaven or by earth or, or with any other oath, but let your yes mean yes and your no mean no so that you won't fall under judgment. And when, when James is talking about swearing here, he's talking about clarity in our speech. He's talking about living a life to the extent where people know beyond any shadow of any doubt, unless providentially hindered, that when you make a commitment, that you're going to follow through with that commitment. That when you say yes to something, yes means yes, and no means no. There's nothing wavering in between, that there's not a gray area between our words and our actions. And you know, one of the quickest ways to discount our testimony as a Christ follower is simply to not keep our word. 
to be someone who has a reputation of being unreliable. And so let me encourage you. I know this is just basic Christianity 101 here, but we're in the middle of a pandemic and we're on the brink of panic. And if we don't get some things nailed down, we're, we're going we're gonna to completely self-destruct. And so James is reminding us, having gone through suffering and learning from the example of the prophets and learning by the example of Job, then, then one of the byproducts, one of the outcomes is going to be clarity of speech. And I want to challenge you today, church, does your yes mean yes and does your no mean no or, or are you kind of wishy-washy when it comes to commitments and to the, to the extent where you tell somebody, yes, I will do that. Yes, I will be there. Yes, you can count on me. But, but those words are a mockery. So he reminds us to be truthful. We shouldn't have to add, uh, I promise, or we shouldn't have to swear to the fact that, yes, we'll be there. Just our word should be good enough. And by the way, parents and grandparents, we owe it to our children and grandchildren to remind them, keep your commitments, keep your words. Your words have meaning. They mean value. Unless you, by your actions, devalue your words. James reminds us, be clear, be honest, keep your word, keep your promises, follow up on your commitment, follow through. That's one of the outcomes of verses, of verses 7 through 11. We get that part done, the endurance and the patience. Okay, how is it going to display itself? One of the ways it's going to display itself is by our credibility. Do we keep our words? But, but another way it's going to display itself is in our effectiveness in prayer. And uh, so James writes about effective prayer in verses 13 through 18, would you follow along with me, please? Is any among you suffering? He should pray. Is, any one, is anyone cheerful? He should sing praises. Is anyone sick? Any, anyone among you sick? He should call for the elders of the church. And they are to pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise him up, and if he have committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins one to another, and pray for one another, so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is very powerful in its effect. Elijah was a human being as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the land. Then he prayed again, and the sky gave rain, and the land produced fruit. Uh, you talk about a powerful passage of Scripture. I mean, just James just takes off and preaches here, and he asks three questions. Is any among you suffering? Is any, uh, anyone cheerful? Is anyone among you sick? And, and remember, he's writing to a church that is scattered, that is persecuted, that has been set upon its head because of, of, of persecution and oppression and, and, uh, and, and events that, have, uh, uh, that, that were completely uh, not predictable and, and they didn't see coming. And so he knows there's suffering among the people. There's cheerfulness among the people. There's sickness among the people. And he asks these questions, three questions, but then also three answers. If you're suffering, he says, you should pray. If you're cheerful, 
You should sing praises. You should exalt the Lord. If you are sick, you should call the elders of the church together, have them pray over you, and anoint you with oil in the name of the Lord. And so he, he presents these scenarios, and then he, then he gives us counsel. Counsel for the suffering. Counsel for the cheerful. Counsel for the sick. And then he adds this. It's uh, about prayer and about faith. Notice in verse 15 he says, uh, The prayer of faith will save the sick person. The Lord will raise him up. And if you, if you have committed sins, he will be forgiven. He talks about the power of that effectual, fervent prayer. Now, does James say that every prayer is going to be answered according to, to our liking? No, he, he doesn't say that. There's a lot of things he says, but there's a lot of things that he doesn't say also. And we have to balance the, the, the truth of God's word with the reality of our, of our circumstances. And I certainly have prayed, and I know that you have. Uh, I have prayed for things, and they did not come about the way that I would have liked for them to. But you know what? We need to keep praying, don't we? We need to keep praying. And I want to encourage you today. Yes, I've, I've, I've been praying and praying about, about this person or about this situation that I'm facing, and, and the answer hasn't come. And I just want to encourage you, you keep on praying. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man, the Bible says, availeth much. And you see, prayer is something that we're, is, is to be ongoing in our life. He also reminds us in verse 16 to confess our sins one to another and pray for one another. And when James talks about that, that's not a mandate for us as a church to just confess our sins one to another as much as, as it is an admonition for accountability. And you see, all of us need an accountability partner. We need someone that we can trust. We need a situation that is safe. Someone that, that, can, uh, that, that can give us counsel. Someone that can uh, pray for us and, and pray with us. And then in verse 17 and 18, James talks about Elijah the prophet. He reminds us, first of all, that Elijah was human just like we are. But he prayed earnestly that it would not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the land. Then he prayed again and the sky gave rain and the land produced its fruit. And he talks about the prayer of the prophet Elijah. And I'm so glad he, he showed us and he reminded us, he reminded us that, that Elijah was human just like you and I, but he, pray, he prayed and God answered his prayer. He prayed earnestly. So to the church that is scattered, the church that is suffering, the church where there is uh, sickness and oppression, uh, for the church where the immediate future seems uncertain, James reminds us, be patient, endure, remember the prophets, remember Job, and when you come through the patience and endurance, one of the outcomes needs to be uh, the way in which you speak and uh, your yes must be yes and your no must be no and you need to keep your commitments and you need to have a, a stellar testimony and, and reputation as a person who keeps their word. But also you are to be a person who prays. And then he wraps this up. Very interesting, verse 19 and 20. The last two verses of the chapter and the last two verses of the book. And he really ends on a high note. 
Don't you love it when a story ends on a high note or a movie ends on a high note? I hate it when movies or books uh, or stories end and there's just, you know, you just drop off the cliff and you don't know what the outcome is and there's, uh, it's mysterious and it's uncertain. But James doesn't do that. He ends on a high note and I love this so much. Verse 19 and 20. My brothers and sisters, if any among you strays from the truth and someone turns him back, let that person know that whoever turns a sinner from the error of his ways will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. This is what the Bible says. That when we, when we are instrumental and we help turn a sinner from the error of his way, we will save his soul from death and cover a multitude of sins. Now, I know that's a very rich phrase theologically. And I'm sure that it has been over the course of history, it has been interpreted and, and maybe uh, explained away or dumbed down, if you will, in many, many different ways. But you know what? I'm going to let the text speak for itself. When God brings us into someone's life and we're instrumental in helping them turn to God, there's just something about that. Something about that that, that, that that brings a sacredness and a special bond between you and that person and you and the Lord and, 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 and even brings you into more favor with the Lord. Because you allowed yourself to be instrumental in helping a person come back to the Lord after they have strayed or come to the Lord initially. That's why the book of James is so important. It is so practical. It is so powerful. And I hope that this has been a blessing to your life. Thank you so much.